Hey everyone, this is Julia Gibbs. I'm excited to be here with you today. It's been a little while and I'm working really hard to finish book three. And so I know I've kind of not been on here, but I wanted to talk to you today about something that the Lord is really speaking to me um, about unleavened bread. And I know it's not something that we think about in the church a lot because usually unleavened bread's not a big deal to us, but I want to talk to you about the feast of unleavened bread. So about a week ago, I had been running the same path over and over each morning and um, I'm out running and I run the same path. It's a great path. I love it. But my husband's like, Hey, I'm home a couple days. And I decided, Hey, Randy, how's it going? I wish I could see you waving at me. <laughs> um, so Jeremy and I go out to walk the path that I run on a normal basis. And as we're walking, I we come up to this area. It's beautiful down here in Coral Springs. And the paths are um, open and really nice. And they have beautiful trees and green grass. And the city takes care of them very well but they're not you know it's like they've got <laughs> hey randy they've got fences and everything they don't belong to anyone it's city paths so we're on this path and uh, we see this man he's like probably in his late 60s maybe early 70s wearing khakis polo shirt tucked in um he's got his penny loafers on you know so he looks pretty nice and um so when I'm, we're walking by on this path, this man is standing there and I notice in his hand is a leaf picker upper. Is that a word? Leaf picker upper? Well, it is now. No. Um, and so, you know, those things that like you use to pick things up, he's got that in his hand and he's picking up leaves that have fallen from the tree that are on the grass and making a pile. And in my mind, as we go by, I'm thinking, that's pretty fruitless, right? Like it's just going to fall down more leaves. Like what is he doing? And he doesn't work for the city. He's like a guy out there working on leaves and um, picking up leaves for his morning time. So day two happens. Jeremy and I go on the same walk the next day at the same time. And he's there again, doing the exact same thing, except his pile that he has previously worked on has been blown all over the place by the wind and he's starting over again. So he's picking up leaves and putting it in the pile. Day three comes around. And on day three, I see this man again and I'm praying as he's standing there because I'm watching him as we walk by and I'm thinking, he's probably struggling with OCD. Like this has got to be obsession and compulsion because it makes no sense what he's doing. So we, we go on and, I, and um, wave at him and move on. So this week comes around and Jeremy's back, back at work. And so I'm running and I'm thinking, I'm gonna talk to the guy. Well, each day I've looked and he hasn't been there. I haven't seen him again, even though he was there for three days in a row, the exact same time doing the exact same thing. And so I stopped when I got there this week and I was asking the Lord, what do you think about what he's doing? And I know you're thinking, why are you getting concerned with the leaf picker upper man, right? But I felt like the Lord was speaking to me about what he was doing. And he said, this is the church. This man is the picture of the American church. And I was like, because he wears penny loafers? No, not really. And a polo? <laughs> um, I, the Lord was just so clear in saying he's doing something to make it look clean. Like he's picking up the leaves, stopping nature from happening. That is the natural season of the time that we are in, of the leaves falling from that tree. It is going to happen. He cannot stop the season that the tree is in. But his solution appears to be just obsession and compulsion. Pick up the leaves, make a pile. Pick up a leaf and make a pile. Because if it looks clean, then we're gonna believe it is clean. Like if we can clean up the church enough so it looks pretty, it's, it's either flashy or it's conservative enough or if it's liberal enough, then we make it look good and we feel good about the work we've done. But the Lord was saying a great wind is coming. And in scripture, an east wind is the wind of judgment that comes in. And I felt like the Lord is saying, you cannot stop the season that the church is in. It is at the point of history that it is in. I control that. I control the days. 
And yet we spend so much time picking up the leaves and piling them behind the trees, thinking we've done great work in the church. Because if we've made it look good, then it is good. And God is saying, we have to stop doing this obsession, compulsion, disorder thing of doing this in the church. We have to be a church that doesn't just pile the ugly behind the trees because the first wind that comes spreads it all back out again. And y'all, this is weird. And hear me in love in this. We are getting a generation of churchgoers who do not know scripture, who when the wind blows, and it is coming, y'all. If you haven't noticed the time and seasons that we are in, then we need to really be praying to be Issachar people. We need to be the tribe of Issachar, the people of David that knew what time it was. That was their whole goal of the Issachars. The, the time is coming when the wind will blow, and all of those leaves are going to be scattered out all over the place, and the church is going to be shocked. The church is going to do what God said don't do. Jesus said don't stand in amazement when these things happen, right? Don't be like, what is happening? Where is God? Because God has been telling us in this book, this is what is coming. This is the season. And I, in Genesis 1.14, I gave you the time. I gave you the stars, the moon, the sky. I gave you these things so that you would know where you are in time, that you would know the time. So I just wanted to bring all of that and wrap that back down to the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Because the Lord is speaking that it's time for the church to be holy, to do more than pile leaves behind the, by, behind the tree because the wind is coming. Hardship is coming for the church. The age of Christendom is coming to an end. Please don't let that scare you because God is not wanting you to be scared, but he is wanting you to be aware of what's happening. So um, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, there are seven feasts that God outlines in Leviticus 23. God never gives what we would call um, a timeline in the Bible besides the feast, okay? The seven feasts of Leviticus 23, that be they begin in Exodus 12 when he shows you the Passover and unleavened bread, but they are accumulated in Leviticus 23 and Deuteronomy 16, I believe. And um, you see these seven feasts laid out. They are feasts that create the calendar of God. Only calendar that's ever given in the Bible are the feast. It is a calendar, walk with me through this, a calendar that becomes a clock because it tells you what time it is on the timeline of history, all right? So I'm gonna say that one more time. The Feast of God is the only calendar ever given by God, and it is a calendar that becomes a clock, all right? And the first three on the clock of God, if you wanna say it that way, um, Passover, Unleavened Bread, and I just forgot the other, first, <laughs> First fruits, right? First fruits. The first three of these we saw were um, fulfilled, if you will, with the first coming of Christ. Then you had Pentecost, that's the fourth one in the middle. And then the latter ones we're waiting for, right, um, are the three that will come. And so we are waiting to see those three come through. In the Bible, um, just so you understand, there are the former rains and the latter rains, the spring rains versus the latter rains, which are the fall rains. These rains, when you read things such as James 5, 7, Hosea 6, 1 through 3, these are referring to these feasts. Just so you know, a little verbiage to have when you're studying your Bible. When it's talking about the former rains and the latter rains, it's literally referring to these feasts because that told them what season they were in and they knew what to plant. So they knew what to harvest. Okay. Do you see the huge spiritual significance and prophecy even in that, that um, God was telling his people? So the first ones are former rain, spring, right, feast, and Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits. I just want to focus in on these a little bit. If you're fascinated with this concept, I have several videos on YouTube that help break it down. And there's so many more things that you can go to. I encourage you to go and really learn about these feasts because they are, they do tell us what time it is in history. 
Um, by the way, if you have a question about what I'm saying, if you type it on the side, I'll try to answer it as we're going. But um, the church is really good, and most of us have heard how Passover was fulfilled by Christ, right? We understand even little details, intricacies that are amazing in Passover, the blood of the lamb being put on the doorpost on, on the right side, the left side, and the top, and how that creates a cross when it drips down, right? It was not allowed to go on the floor um, because... Hebrew says, if you become a believer and you turn back again, it is as though you are trampling upon the blood of Christ. The blood did not go on the floor because mankind cannot trample upon the blood. That was the um, huge thing about it being on the doorpost, but not on the floor. Um, Rebecca, you asked about the feast on YouTube. Look up on, on the Julia J. Gibbs, look up um, seven festivals of God. There's a part one and part two. Okay. That will help. Um, so back to Passover. Um, there's uh, so many things about Passover we can get into. And probably a lot of you have heard these in church. For instance, they were not allowed to break the bones of the lamb. Was Jesus' bones broken? Absolutely not. It was prophetic, okay? Because the, the Roman centurion that went up, he did not break Jesus' bones. He speared him on the side. There's so much prophecy in that. Where did Adam, Eve get pulled from Adam's side? You know, so much, so much. But um, even down to, if you actually look in Exodus 12, verse 6, your Bible might have a little bit of different verbiage here, but you have to go to the Hebrew, and this is a prophecy. You shall keep it unto the 14th day of the month. So Passover is always on the 14th day of Nisan, all right? Um, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Um, once again, this is Exodus 12, verse 6. Passover is to be on the 14th day of Nisan, and you see here that they are instructed to kill their lambs at twilight. You see, our English versions correct what we would call a grammatical error here, but if you go to the Hebrew, which I really recommend you do, and a, a great way to do that is to use blueletterbible.com, go look at the Hebrew. It doesn't actually say their lambs. If you see down in verse 12, you realize, oh, every family had their own lamb. So we're fixing a grammatical error here because let me tell you what it reads in the Hebrew. The whole congregation of Israel is to gather, to, um, the congregation of Israel is to gather and kill it, it, okay? Kill it at twilight, meaning a single lamb. We in English think, oh, there's a grammatical error here not in prophecy. Do you remember Matthew 27, 25? They will be standing before Pilate and Pilate will say, this man's not guilty. I see nothing in him that says he should die for this. And they will cry out, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. We all know that great anti-Semitism grew in the church and it's why we have so many um, disconnects from the Old Testament to the New Testament to this day. But we know that all of us were the ones crying that out, but specifically prophetically, the Jews together sacrificed the lamb. Okay. I'm not pointing fingers at J Jewish people. Please don't misunderstand me. I am Barnabas. Okay. Like I, I mean, Barabbas, I am the one that did this. All of us are with our sin, but you can see here so many things about Passover um, Jesus fulfilled. It was prophecy for Jesus and what he would do. But next on the line, so you have the 14th day of Nisan is Passover. Well, the next day begins what they call the Feast of Unleavened Bread. If you're wondering what in the world is this, here in um, Exodus 12, you can read a little bit more starting at 15. Seven days you shall eat leavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven out of your houses. For if anyone eats what is leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person is cut off from Israel. Okay, so you get an instruction starting to happen here. So he's saying, you're going to eat unleavened bread. And the reason why you're going to eat it is that when they were told, so you find this out, go to Deuteronomy 16. You can read a little bit more about this. But when they were told, hey, it's time to go, 
It's time. The Lord is saying the Passover is over. Grab your stuff. You're leaving Egypt. You're going to follow me out of here. When they did that, they had no time for the Passover, for their bread to rise. Okay. So they grabbed it and they went. Passover bread, if you notice, even has holes in it and stripes. And we as believers know that even that is prophetic for the holes that would be in Jesus Christ and the stripes that would heal you, as the Bible says, by your stripes stripes, you are healed. Jesus himself will relate himself to bread and say, I am the bread of life. He will kill this. I mean, he will kill. He will feed the 6,000 and he will feed the 4,000 because not that that's just a random thing he decides that day, but because he is relating himself being the bread of life all the way back to being the manna provided by God in the wilderness to those who were taught to keep these feasts. Okay. He's saying, I am the one that feeds you from heaven. It is me. I am the very one from God, the word of God that you must consume every day yourself. You must eat it completely. You cannot waste any of it. So up here in, Deuter in Deuteronomy 16, 3, you shall eat no leavened bread with it. Seven days you shall eat it with unleavened bread, the bread of affliction. What did Jesus take on? The cup of affliction. He took it for us upon himself. He becomes the bread of affliction for us. For you came out of the land of Egypt in haste. All of the days of your lives, you must remember this is why we do it. So church, we are so disconnected from this that we don't even see the significance in it. But I want to tell you, it's crucial to understanding sanctification in the church. Okay, it's crucial to understanding this. And um, why? Why? Why have unleavened bread? Besides the fact that they were to be immediately obedient and take their bread out and get on the road and start leaving because God said, hey, it's time to leave. Pharaoh is done with you. I'm taking you into the wilderness. So there's another reason. Leaven from the beginning to the end of the Bible is presented as sin. Okay, so we have prototypes. Um, we have these things in the scripture over and over. Um, I know, for instance, in Hebrew alone, there are 35 different laws of hermeneutics, okay? Meaning like what we would say allegories, um, similes, things like that that are used in scripture. Leaven is from the beginning to the end, a picture or a representative of sin. So God is saying, you're going to eat after the Passover. And the church is so good with the Passover, the concept of you need the blood of Jesus. You need to get saved. So we really embrace Passover because we get that part of the story. But I want to present to you that just like the man that I was talking about at the beginning, picking up the leaves and putting them in the pile, we are falling short as a church at embracing what it means to live a life of unleavened bread, meaning that when Jesus was saying, I'm going to become the bread for you, it is on unleavened bread that he is dead in the grave. He dies on Passover and he is in the grave on unleavened bread because he took the leaven upon himself. Him who knew no sin became sin for us so that we can eat the bread of life and live. But unleavened bread was a process. You had to clean your house out. It's called bed hot comets, okay? The time when they're cleaning everything out, if you don't realize it, when Jesus goes in John 3 and cleans out the temple, it's right before pa Passover. He is himself acting out bed hot kemets, saying kemets is leaven. You have to take it out. You cannot let sin rule in your life for sin will destroy you. And the church has become so good at embracing the blood of Jesus Christ and the Passover from death. And hallelujah, it's so true. But y'all, we are falling short in creating disciples of Christ because we are falling short in embracing a life lived of unleavened bread festival. Does that make sense? I'm just, and this is what the, the scripture is trying to tell us, that Jesus is saying, I give you the blood, I pour it upon you, but you have to learn spiritual discipline. It is not a works religion. Don't, don't start getting stressed out that I'm talking about works. But I'm saying, if you don't have fruit in your life, you're not grafted into the tree. 
Jesus said, I'll cut the tree down that doesn't have fruit, right? We have to be people that are living a life of sanctification. Justification is Passover. Sanctification is unleavened bread. Because the third one, first fruits on the 17th of Nisan, is when Jesus would rise from the dead, being, as Paul writes in Corinthians, the first fruits of all of us who will one day rise from the dead, right? be risen from the dead. We have to be people that are cleaning out the leaven. Go with me quickly to 1 Corinthians, and I'll show you where Paul actually refers to this process. 1 Corinthians 5, starting in verse 6. Your boasting is not good. Okay, he's talking to the Corinthians, and I just, in love, want us to hear this right now because I so strongly hear the Lord saying this to our church as a whole, and it's good for us to repent as a whole together of what is happening. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? A little sin is a lot of a problem. A little sin destroys teachers. A little sin breaks down families. A little sin destroys and divides a church. A little sin spreads out and leavens the whole lump. In the age of authenticity, when we're so wanting to be authentic with each other, and I I believe that is gospel. I believe that the Lord was clearly authentic and wanted you to be who you are and be honest and have accountability, but not at the sacrifice of moving and growing and maturing in Christ. Authenticity has to be a level where we, t- where we talk to each other and we're honest with each other, but we're constantly improving um, in the sense of saying, let's go to the Lord on that. We've got to walk out of this. We cannot sit in sin and just say, it's how I am, right? Not today or these little cute sayings that I just can't even, right? Please don't misunderstand. I'm not trying to be Debbie Downer, but y'all, we've we've adopted this um, place in the church of authenticity, which is really only a peach tree dish for sin to harbor and to grow and to leaven the whole lump because now it's just who I am and I'm just being me. I'm just me doing me kind of thing. And we're not encouraging each other to grow, to stretch, to be transformed, to be changed by the power of the Holy Spirit. So Paul is going to say in um, 1 Corinthians 5, 7, cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump. So as you really are unleavened, you're called to live a life of the feast of unleavened bread. For Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. If you wonder, do these Old Testament stories really speak of prophecy? Paul himself is telling you this. If you need more, go to Jesus, because he tells you this over and over, that the whole book was about him. That's what he says to to the Pharisees. Um, For Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival. What festival is he talking about? Unleavened bread. Let us celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, not living up under the old law. That's what he's saying. You don't have to live under the old law of religion where you feel terrible about yourself, where you're making a checklist. I'm, I'm not going to sin today. I'm not going to say any bad words, right? Um, I'm not going to do this today. Oh, and you're a failure for that. That is an old checklist way of dealing with leaven. And I want to tell you as a woman, women's Bible studies are littered with this concept. We don't realize it. It sneaks in there really small, but it makes you want to make a checklist of how to be a better wife. Don't get me started on the Proverbs 31, um, like, um, what's it called? Yoke that, that religion tries to put over women saying, this is a checklist that you must meet all of these when it was supposed to be a beautiful acrostic prayer to point you towards God. Um, not a checklist of what you are and are not, right? That's heavy. That's the old leaven that sits on you and says, you're never going to be good enough. You're never okay. Sin rules over you. That's the old way of religion. And that's not what Paul's saying either. He's saying, get rid of that. The leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Paul is saying, we don't have to live under legalism that religion so often tries to put us under, but we 
are accountable. And we are accountable to the new way that God is calling us to live of the bread of sincerity and truth saying, don't deny that sin is sin. Don't become someone so watered down that you don't even realize when you're sinning anymore or when the church is sinning. Do not give in to the belief that all ways are okay, that all gods lead to the same God, that nothing is unacceptable and that we are called to tolerate everything and love nothing because that is what our society is teaching. And Paul is saying right here, no, 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 it, it doesn't mean legalism, okay? It doesn't mean anger and hate and malice and evil that so often the church has embraced. But what it means is that when you are in Christ, you cannot help but want to stop sinning. You cannot help but live a holy life and, and run after the Kodesh, right? The holiness of God. He's called us to that. And so are you called to grow and mature? Absolutely. And if you stay in a place where you refuse to identify sin, refuse to deal with things in your own life, refuse to even go to a church that deals with these things, then you're just wallowing in the peach tree dish. And it's no better, it's no better there than it is where the really angry side of the church sits that just accuses everyone and passes judgment on everyone. Both sides are wrong because both sides are made up of men who are trying to make their own way to God. And God is saying, my way is with sincerity and truth. And it is my way. And we must honor that. So I think about the man that I've seen cleaning up leaves and the piles of leaves and God saying, as soon as the wind blows, all of his work is futile. You see, it's going to blow all over the place. And everything he spent his days doing was pointless with one breath of air right? With one blowing of the wind. And so I just want to encourage as the church to remember, we are not trying to make people look good. We're not trying to please the world. We're not trying to be the coolest church or have the best light show. We're not trying to um, be the angriest church or the people against everything. We are called to be people that bring transformational change through inviting them into a relationship with Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And that work is hard, but that work is eternal. And so when the wind blows and know for certain that it is coming, because this scripture has told us that it is coming, hear the war drums pounding, hear the sound that is coming, that the Lord is saying it's coming. We must train up our people so that when it comes, we do not have an entire generation that stands amazed and says, I didn't even know this was going to happen. I don't even know what God says about this. I don't even know what decision to make. And it's because we never really taught we never called up disciples. We never required of our people to grow and to stretch. We simply made them feel good. We simply entertained them. As um, Nirvana actually said, I know that you're thinking you're quoting Nirvana, but absolutely. Kurt Cobain, if you could, <laughs> if you could for a minute. I remember being in third grade when that song came out and played over the radio. Um, Here we are now, entertain us. I feel stupid. Y'all, I know Kurt Cobain is a different story, but hear that he spoke that over generations and the generations embraced it. And now we are at a place where we have very, very weak believers in Christ and a massive amount of people that go to church every week singing that song, here I am now, entertain me. And the God is calling us to deeper places in him. Finally, I want you to flip over to Matthew 13. There are seven kingdom parables that Jesus will give, um, seven churches of the revelation, and these all align, seven festivals, seven days of creation. Do you see how the scripture is teaching us about patterns and who God is through the patterns? One of those stories is found in Matthew 13, one of those seven, 33, and it's about leaven, what we've been talking about, and that leaven is a representative of sin. Now, some churches, um, some teachers that are way smarter than me, don't get me wrong, um, might teach this differently, and we can, that's okay. But I'm going to tell you that leaven is, I cannot find a place in scripture where leaven is good. It's always referring to sin, right? And so here, often we have taught Matthew 13, 33. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven 
that a woman took and hid in measures of flour till it was all leavened. You see, we teach a lot that that's the gospel, that you spread a little leaven in and look at how it changes things. It just grows. But I want to present to you that that would be changing the model that the Lord has been given, giving us since Exodus 12 about leaven. And it's also contrary to even what Paul is writing, right? When he's saying, don't use that. You need the new, right? To celebrate this unleavened lifestyle, meaning living a lifestyle, a holy lifestyle. And here we see this picture that God's like, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid. And it actually coincides with Thyatira, the, one of the churches um, in the book of Revelation. But he's saying that the church is going to get to a point, and hear this, where sin is going to just spread through it. And it's going to multiply and they're not even going to see it's sin anymore. And the book of Jude and the book of um, and First Peter, Second Peter, you see these warnings saying, this is going to happen, but I will secure a remnant. And so I'm speaking to you today saying, we need to know what time it is. We need to be believers that stop spreading the leaven and saying it's good. And we need to be people that are asking God, Lord, what are you calling us to be? Let me break away from what even like man-made religion has said I'm supposed to be. And what if it's so much harder than what I've been taught? What if it's so much deeper and yet so much freer than I've ever imagined you to be? What if I do not have to live with these things that I've lived with all my life and the church just says, just keep enduring, keep enduring. And you're saying, no, no, there is deep healing in Christ and healing is real and healing is still happening. And the works of the spirit are being poured out upon the church and it's changing people, but we're still picking up leaves, making our piles and thinking that is what being the church is about. What if it's more? What if it's living a life in the festival of unleavened bread? Because we understand that the Passover blood is calling us to live a life of holiness so that we can be with Jesus on the first fruits, right? That he is the first fruits of those who are risen from the dead. And what if he's saying, these three I did fulfill, but I'm coming back. We live in the era of Pentecost right now, the age of the church where the spirit is pouring out. But the three, the later um, fall rains are coming and they will be fulfilled on his second coming when Mashiach David, Messiah of David returns the second time. And he is coming and the church right now is weak and we need to gird up. We need to teach our children. We need to be churches that are less concerned about children's ministry, having the best videos or like light show because then we're raising adults that come to church saying, here I am now, entertain me. We are raising a Kurt Cobain generation in church, when we teach children that church is about just coming and being entertained, and then the gospel is the weakest part of the message. And then you go to churches where the gospel is the weakest part of the message because it's really about the lights and the flashing and the music and us feeling good when we leave there. And we're doing it again and again and again, and we are wondering why people are still broken. They've been in church for 10 years and they're dealing with the same stuff. They've never been delivered from depression. They've never been seen a change in their family. They've never seen their marriage get any better. They've never seen their husband come to Christ. They've never seen these things because we, the church, are not offering living water. We're just saying, here we are now. I'll entertain you. So church, I just hope today um, that you hear my heart, that please know this is not a condemnation. This is the Lord calling us, stop picking up leaves and putting it into pile and believing that the wind is not coming. Hear that the Lord is saying, know for certain the wind is coming. The age of Christendom is almost over. It's ending in America. And we have to realize that we must train up. We must know the scripture, abide by the word, be transformed, fully filled the Holy Spirit and the word of God so that we can live a life that lead 
other people, the Great Commission to Jesus Christ and through the power of the Holy Spirit. So I'm just, I'll just pray and end us today. Lord, I pray for everyone that is hearing this, this today. And, I, and we just stand together. If y'all will, just, just pray with me right now. God, I'm praying for the American church. And Lord, I pray for the churches of the world, but I want, I'm a part of the American church and I pray for my people and for my church. Lord, let us leave away the opinions of men, the doctrines of men, the way and order of men. Let that fall apart for us, God, and let us find the treasure beneath it, which is the gospel message, the word of God that literally breathed life into creation and called us all to be. Lord, the thing that made me and formed me in the womb, Lord, the word of God, I ask that we will stand in alignment with the heavenlies by the word of God, Jesus, and that we will awaken, O oh sleepers, those in our church services that are sitting week after work, just wanting to be entertained. We ask that you will break the yoke of entertainment off of us. You will break the yoke of shallow waters off of us. You will break the yoke that says, just be a nominal Christian and that's enough. We reject that in the name of Jesus Christ. And we ask, Father, that you awaken the spirit of the saints, Lord Jesus. Awaken us, Lord, and that the remnant of God will be prepared for when the wind blows. I do not fear what comes tomorrow because I know the end. I know that you are victorious and I am victorious in you. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Thank y'all and I'll see you again soon. Praise God.